Hello to all my friends out there. So this is The White Stag by Kate Surity. Uh, this book itself is 55 years old. And if you notice something super interesting about this book, it's written and illustrated by the author. And, and these are some fabulous illustrations. Okay, this is part nine, chapter four, part three. And I'm probably going to finish it up here. Gradually, the storm abated. Ahead of them was still night, but in the east, the sky grew gray with waking light, and then they saw that the white stag had led them into a winding defile between towering peaks, a deep secret gorge eaten through the rocks by a rivulet. To the left and the right, were the overhanging cliffs, leaning over the gorge curiously like giants leaning down to watch a, a procession of ants. A faint green light hovered above the cliffs. Then, a, then the pale golden rays of the rising sun poured into the gorge. The pass widened, the rocks and cliffs drew back and gave way to, to gentle wooded slopes. The white stag was hardly visible now. In the golden daylight, it seemed to have lost all substance and became light against light. Attila and Bendigaz reined in their horses and watched that shiny radiance until it was no more. Then they drew aside, waiting for those behind them to pass. For hours, the immense cavalcade poured forth from the gorge flooding the sunlight west front flooding the sunlit westerly slopes of the mountains winding like a giant dragon amid amid mid trees and shrub the slopes were billow, were a billowing sea of spears and the excited voices of the multitude pulsed like rushing waves the sun reached its noonday height when the last heavy wagons arrived. After them, the cavernous mouth of the gorge gaped empty. The Huns were across the border barrier. And on the other side of the Carpathians, the blizzard raged for days. The east wind swept snow against the mountains like a gigantic broom, sweeping deep valleys in the snow on the ground forming new ridges of drifts covering the broken path of the Huns and hiding perhaps forever the secret entrance to the pass. What enchanted land is this? asked Attila of each golden dawn and every scarlet sunset as they advanced towards the west. The slim legs of his black steed fairly danced as he rode swiftly through the forest and field his eyes scanning the ever-changing beauty of the land, the like of which he had never seen before. What enchanted land is this, wondered old Bendigaz, riding beside his son, a land like an immense green bowl, surrounded by mountains, warmed by the sun, and sheltered from the cold. Behind them rolled the great army, their weapons and helmets glittering in the sunlight, in the moonlight. What enchanted land is this, they thought as they rode through the forest, rich in game, across rivers, alive with fish, 
Spring had met them on the way and flung a glorious carpet of flowers under their feet, as if spring were welcoming long-awaited friends. Winter and hostile army armies were locked out by those gray rocky walls which had so miraculously opened to let them through the few small tribes who inhabited this land showed no ill will what enchanted land is this where new riches new beauty spread out before them every hour riches and beauty cupped together under a laughing blue sky where the joy of life and peace trembled in each opening bud where the song of whis- of whispering breeze and gurgling brooks had the magic power to banish memories of the bloodshed. Only seven days had passed since they had crossed the Carpathians, and the despair of that stormy night seemed seven lifetimes away. A land rich in game and green pastures between two great rivers, rich in fish and surrounded by mountains, The legendary words of Nimrod chime like bells of hope in the heart of Attila when after crossing the river Pathasus had swift riding scouts return and told him that within a day's journey to the west there was another wide river, the Danubus. He decided to let his people rest for a while. All that day, men and women worked joy, joy, joyless, joylessly, happily, pulling tents, preparing for a long spring festival, a festival of thanksgiving to Hudar. They built an altar, the first altar to Hadar, since they had left the Magyars. It was ready by sundown, a great altar, carefully built, It stood like a monument of faith on the crest of a solitary hill above rolling green plains. Night fell softly spreading its wings of silence over the sleeping camp. Sentry fires glowed for a while, then closed their eyes, and only the stars' villant sentinels of the night kept watch over the earth. They watched as the ghost hour crept in among the tents, trailing its mantle of dreams. They watched when, in the deep silence of the ghost hour, a lone man, a tall, majestic figure, wrapped in a white cloak walked walk slowly to the altar the co- the stars caught a glimpse of scarlet under the white cloak and they knew who the man was they watched as the man before whose sword a continent trembled sank to his knees and touched his forehead to the cold stone they listened and heard his prayers but the stars kept their silence for it was not for them to answer. Between the stars and the man, shadows passed on silent on silent white wings. White herons returned from the south now that the long winter was over. They passed silently, and when at last the man arose and lifted his eyes to the sky, the herons were gone. He only saw a single wispy white feather as it came drifting down, its edges pure silver in the starlight. It touched his upturned face and came to rest over his heart. And then he knew that his prayers had been heard and would be granted. Before dawn, people began to gather for the festival. They came afoot and on horseback from all directions, for the tribe was so numerous now that that the forest of their tents stretched further than the eye could see. Men, women, and children came bringing gifts to Hudar. Single spring blossoms clutched in tiny fists of babies, battle-worn shields, jeweled swords and helmet, treasures, possessions of old warriors. They came and laid their gifts around the altar. They joined the ever-growing crowd below the hill.
Old Bendigaz came, lighted the fire on the altar, and stood waiting, his face towards, turned towards the east where Attila's tent glowed like a giant red flower on the green grass. The dark sky behind the distant blue mountains grew luminous with the promise of sun, sunrise. A murmur of admiration arose from the waiting crowd, for just as the first flaming arrow of the new day shot upwards from the rising sun, they saw Attila riding towards them, all red and gold against the glowing sky. His shining helmet caught the light behind him, and it seemed as if he were wearing a golden crown. His amber-colored eyes looked straight ahead, and the light in them matched the light of the sun. There was no one among his people so silently watching his approach who, who would not have died thousands of deaths for him, their red eagle, greatest of all leaders. He was more than a leader. He was their king, and he looked a god with the golden crown of the rising sun around his head. A small girl tore her hand from her mother's fingers and ran forward until and ran towards Attila, towards all his shining glory with outstretched arms. She ran, she ran, her little laughing face upturned, her small bare feet twinkling in the smooth grass. Attila mounted and waited, smiling back at her. When the child stumbled and fell, she cried and held up beseeching hand to him, and Attila, who soared, had dealt thousands of death, bent down to comfort the child. Then, while he knelt beside her, the sharp glint of metal caught his eyes. A curious, fiery glint. He reached for it, and his fingers closed on the hilt of a sword, deeply embedded in the soil. It gave to the pool, pole of his mighty arm, and he looked at it with glo with a growing sense of awe. It was a hun sword, straight and slim, and on the smooth surface of his blade was the chaste image of a flying eagle. His face grew pale, holding the sword on the palms of his hand, he walked slowly up the altar, blind to the crowd thronging around him, his eyes never leaving the face of his father. He saw the face grow as white as his own. He saw the strong lips tremble, and he heard the hoarse, choked whisper, The sword of Hudar. The words echoed from thousand, lips of thousands, The sword of Hudar. Slowly he turned and laid one arm around the bent old shoulders of Bendigaz. In his right hand, he held the sword and lifted it high above his head, pointing it straight to the morning sky. His eagle eyes glazed unflinchingly into the sun, and his voice rose triumphant, like a bugle call of victory. Upon this altar of Hudar, our powerful god, with his sword in my hand, I swear to Adar, Hudar above, to the sun to the east, to the moon in the west, I swear to the stars in the north and the stars in the south to protect and hold this land against all powers on earth for my people. Then he mounted to the highest step on the altar and slashed the air with the sword to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, and stood again facing the sun. The rising flames of the fire behind him like great flaming wings, the sword in his upraised arm pointed to the sky. He stood, king of the promised land, Attila, the, the conqueror.